you Since you heard from me From some God for stinking place Well, that soon is kill a man Woman, boy, a girl Because of their race She knows, she knows, she knows 
conversation this evening within the framework of having a conversation about what I call the age of Ferguson and the age of Ferguson is bookended by two zeitgeist the zeitgeist der Ängste and the zeitgeist der Freiheit by zeitgeist der Ängste we mean that the spirit of the age of angst that in part begins with and it is articulated and embodied in the presidency of Barack Obama which we saw over 250,000 people gathering in Germany because after the era of George Bush, we saw the possibilities of something democratic emerging outside of and inside the most powerful empire in the human history, the United States of America. And so this sense of freedom, but it's also touched by and tampered by a zeitgeist, the angst, meaning that the ways in which we struggle to come to know ourselves and the angst written as, an, as a part and parts of our understanding of the global collapse of the economy which dominated much of the political life and the social landscape of the United States of America beginning in 2008. And so that angst and that freedom are at work and that perhaps we are in our conversation about the courage to rebel is a conversation that it attempts to bring in about to usher in a zeitgeist there, agape, a kind of spirit of age that is primarily obsessed with sacrificial love. But love not as a term of an emotional bosh, but rather the kind of love that one is willing to put one's body on the line for something older than oneself and bigger than oneself. And so then between these two bookends, we have a conversation about the age of Ferguson, which is characterized by three distinctive features. Those distinctive features being one, the occupation of public space. And so West Florissant in St. Louis, Missouri was our Tahir Square because it is a reaction over and against the three primary features of neoliberalism, which are privatization, militarization, and individualization. And so then the occupation of public space is a response to the privatizing of space in which in the United States of America that the primary form of the public square is the mall, where one buys and consumes. It's not a place for democratic dialogue. It is not a place where we come to understand what it means to be democratic citizens within the framework of this particular Western democracy, this first attempt in human history at a multiracial civilization. And so the occupation of public space and the rejection of traditional leadership, whether it be the multiplicity of lecture, uh, elections that take place 
in Egypt, whether it be the revolutionary government that is in part emerged in Tunisia, whether it be the young people who are engaging in resistance in Gaza during the vicious attack by Israeli apartheid forces upon the people of Palestine, that we see a critique among young activists, not only of the occupation, but we see also a critique of the Palestinian authority. So it is a rejection of traditional leadership. In, in the context of the United States, Al Sharpton can come on the night, street at night in Ferguson because that leadership has been rejected. And then the third distinctive feature of the age of Ferguson in our conversation about the courage to rebel has to do with our understanding of the fact that this generation, your generation, is calling into question the very systems that previous generations sought to be a part of. And so the part of the popular mythology, this is not the history, but we're talking about the mythology of the civil rights movement was integration. But what we're seeing in terms of various forms of organizing is the calling into question the very legitimacy of the system of which people have tempted to integrate in. This is much of the question that we have to do that emerges out of our understanding of the nation state. For the nation state itself is a problematic feature given its construction of borders and decides who is in and who is out, who deserves civil rights, who deserves human rights, and who does not. And so the construction of the nation state is a problematic feature, particularly in the context of the conversation about Israel and Palestine, that if the objective for previous generation was the creation of a two-state solution, we see young leadership bearing a critique that understands the ways in which that the very notion of the nation state itself is in question, thereby calling into question the very notion of modernity. For we see the rise of fundamentalism. On this point, I do agree with Zizak, just this point. <laughs> that we see the rise of fundamentalism in this particular age of Ferguson has to do with a failure of modernity. That the promises that the Western civilization made to their previous colonial subjects about engaging in certain forms of modernity, i.e. capitalism, as a way to increase the quality of life of its citizens has proven to be fallacious. The same is the case for young people who've turned out in record numbers for Barack Obama. But for many young people at this point, given the political construct and the ways in which African Americans have lost on every social indicator under a black president that the emperor has no clothes. So it's a calling into question these various systems and this is the way in which we come to understand the age of Ferguson and that a conversation about the courage rebel, we raise the name of the great Albert Camus, my soul made who says that when the rebel rebels the rebel is saying no, but the rebel is not only saying no, they are saying yes to a different set of possibilities. And so the struggle is not simply a struggle of existential proportion, meaning the ways in which we attempt to make meaning for ourselves and as finite beings faced with infinite possibilities of death, dread, and despair, but rather it's not only about how we make meaning, but it's a calling into question the very ontology of those things that have been given to us. So it's an unearthing, a calling into questioning, a wrestling with these various notions of whether it be integration into the American Democratic Project or whether it be the possibilities of modernity in the Middle East. And so the courage to rebel begins not only at the existential level in terms of the way in which people come to make meaning for themselves, but it is ontological in that sense because it is constructing a new mode of being. What kind of human beings are we going to be? Now, I come from a tradition of a people who had limited and continued to have limited po political victories. For we exist in a nation that has two glaring contradictions. One, the stating of the obvious is a revolutionary act. Black Lives Matters. <laughs> Another feature of the recalcitrant nation in terms of a constructed as a morally breakrupt project that is about the enslavement of black bodies upon stolen land, so it is ontologically flawed, that within the framework of that system so morally bankrupt that it has, that people of African descent, and we can add that to women broadly, we can add that to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender persons broadly, we can add that to immigrants, we can add that uh, in, on the question of the Islamophobia at work in the United States of America at this particular moment in history, that we come to understand that this system has been so recalcitrant that it didn't even want these historically other people to participate in this morally bankrupt system. That is the nature 
of what we are wrestling with. And so the courage to rebel in the face of these kinds of onslaughts, which are highly material but also existential because they help shape the way in which we define and note ourselves in this context. And so the rebellion of the people who produced me are a people who have come to understand, given that they had such fleeting polit political victories, that their legislative assaults are always underway and always under attack. Even the Voting Rights Act consistently under attack for the past decade is that when we could do nothing else, we would sing a song. That part of who we are as a people is how does one come to wrestle with one's humanity in the face of inhumane conditions. And so then music becomes a way in which it is a salve, it is a possibility, and it's not simply about soothing individual anxieties, but it's about empowering a people and also articulating a collective well. This is why we began with the mothers of the, the tears and the wells of the mothers with Goodbye Baby. Because we can't have an abstract conversation if we're going to have a real conversation about real human beings and real beings, not simply couch in abstract conversations and abstract notions of police brutality and police reform. We're talking about mothers who have lost their children. And so we named them as a way to keep track of their humanity. And it's not only about naming those mothers, but it's also naming those who suffer a disproportionate amount of violence at the hands of the state, particularly those transgender folks who died disproportionately, not only in the face of police brutality, some 33% of all trans folks have found themselves inside the prison industrial complex, highest levels of suicide, disproportionate levels of suicide among this population by virtue of the fact that these, so we name them, so we say India Clark. As a way, Lamia Beard, we say their names as a way to keep track of their humanity in such a way that the possibility to rebel in this particular context has to do with us keeping track of the names of the people and not to disembody them while disempowering them. So we name them not only as a philosophical act, in terms of the way in which naming has come to construct and has also been a form of linguistic resistance among black people. So we name our children Shaniqua and Fuquanda and Trayvon as ways to rebel over and against a system that tends to make black bodies nameless. So naming is a form of rebellion in the context of the American empire. And so we name. Part of that naming has to do with honoring the possibilities of a people who have encountered the death, dread, and despair of the American empire and somehow have sustained themselves. And the way in which they sustained themselves has been through mourning. And mourning not simply as a form of wailing with no end, but it is a marker unto itself. It is the possibility of saying to oneself that one is grieving, but we don't let the grief have the last word. And part of not letting the grief have the last word is to be able to sing one's way out. This is the best of the black tradition. So we sing. Princess, I'm here to hold you. Shut down in cold blood. Sister, sister, I know I'm late. My hands are bloody.
understand that our courage to rebel is connected to who is human, who has access to what possibilities, what are the ways in which we come to know, come to know those who are historically othered. But it's not simply coming to know those, it is not simply reading books, it is not simply having the right kind of analysis. Oftentimes white folks say to me, they say, Reverend Seiko, I'm anti-racist, and I go, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> and so my next question to them is, have you ever been to a black funeral? Does somebody love you enough that when they're putting their mama in the ground, they want you standing next to them? That is solidarity. And that question of solidarity, in part, finds itself within the context of the narrow tradition that, uh, which was bequeathed to me out of the kind of Judeo-Christian narrative, particularly that of the black Pentecostal tradition in the, in the rural South, in the Arkansas Delta, that was preoccupied with telling the truth about the darkness but not letting to have the darkness having the last word, which is a revolutionary act in America which is preoccupied with new, which is preoccupied with happiness, which is distinct from joy. It was preoccupied with optimism, which is a distinctly different from hope. Because joy and hope are not predicated upon what is happening as it relates to the material conditions. One exists in the, with hope and joy in spite of the material conditions. And part of the shaping of the material conditions has to do with a separation, a fragmentation, a commodification of individual bodies and individual people who can be bought and sold not only on the economic marketplace, but who are traded as though that they are horses within the framework of the electoral system. And so the question before is, who is our neighbor? What does it mean to have a neighbor? And that part of what it means to be a neighbor is being able to move out of social Darwinian spaces called hoods where there are no neighbors. And it is also has to do with understanding that part of the, of the Judo-Christian ethic at the heart of it that is articulated by the prophets and in the context of the Hebrew scriptures is to love oneself, to love one's neighbor as oneself. So who is one's neighbor is the question that is posed to us out of 
the affirmations and the acknowledgement that we live in an age that is pre that is saturated with angst and freedom.
wanna stop 